Good morning, church. My wife and I, and Genevieve, are very happy to be back with you folks. It's an honor to be here and to meet and worship with one of God's great churches. With respect to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, his return, Jesus gave us two instructions. First, he said, watch. Second, he said, be ready. Adventists have specialized in watching for the coming of the Lord, have spe specialized in studying the signs of the times which herald the coming. Since the 1830s, we have been scrutinizing the news for fulfillments of prophecy over the past decades. These days, some of us, perhaps some of you, are suffering from a little prophecy fatigue. You've heard about the dates. 1830, 1755, 1798, 1844. And you have heard about what the Pope is up to, or might be up to. Adventists are not alone in being concerned about the Pope. Uh, my wife and her mother made friends with a, a very little lady, a diminutive lady, who was a nun. And she was a delightful, charming person, part of our family for a long time. And one day she, she, she whispered to us confidentially that a black pope is coming, and it might be the next one. See? A lot of people are looking to the head of the world church for fulfillment of prophecies and signs. And so there are some weary of prophecy and one interpretation competing with another interpretation. There have been some who have said, let's leave the future in God's hands. Let's just concentrate on doing the best we can for our families, for our society, for our neighborhoods. Let's try to make the world a better place and leave the coming of Christ with the Lord. Jesus will return when the time is right. And I agree with a lot of that sentiment. I think we ought to trust the Lord in terms of the future, and we ought to work very hard trying to make the world a better place. There are others who have been suffering from <clears throat> gloom and doom syndrome. Because when the second coming of Christ is mentioned in the context of prophecy, it just seems like we have to hear once again about the time of trouble, about the great tribulation, and how hardly any of us, the very elect, will even be able to stand. And none of us come to church to be depressed or to be scared. And so some would just rather hear about other things pertaining to daily life and daily experience and not all that focus on scary prophecy. But I have good news for you this morning. Very good news. And we're going to we're going to get the uh, we're going to get the words of Jesus here in Matthew chapter 24 verse 36 because he's the one that's really going to be bringing the good news to us this morning. Matthew 24 and verse 36, Jesus said, No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so will it be at the coming of the Son of Man. No one knows about that day or that hour or I'm going to add that year. Now, how is that good news? 
It's good news in this respect. Every day that passes, we are one day closer to the second coming of Christ because God knows and has always known when he's going to give Jesus the green light, give Jesus the signal to come back. God is not waiting and watching the signs and discussing the, the, the most appropriate time for Christ to come back with committees of angels. He's always known the date on which Christ's coming will occur. Therefore, the good news, I want to say it again. Every day that passes, we are one day closer to the coming of Christ. Can you say amen to that? Now, some will say, but Pastor Rockney, aren't we Laodiceans, all of us? Absolutely true. In Matthew chapter 25, the parable of the ten virgins, the ten bridesmaids, they were all asleep. They were all Laodicean. Five of them had enough Holy Spirit power, Holy Spirit reservoir. When the coming of Christ did occur, they were able to get up and go in with the bridegroom into the kingdom. But they were asleep. They were Laodicean. Now, you know what God said to Elijah? You remember what he said? Elijah was very depressed about the spiritual condition of Israel. And he said, I'm the only one. And God said to him, I have how many? 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. 7,000. You think you're the only one? 7,000 have not bowed the knee to Baal. Some people are very concerned about the spiritual preparation of the church for the second coming, and we ought to be. But everything that will happen, everything that's happening, the fulfillment of prophecy, the preparation of the church for the second coming of Christ, great events in world history, all of these things God has known forever, when they will all come together at just the right time. He is not going to be surprised by when Christ comes back, we will be surprised by when Christ comes back. Now, I want to add another scripture to this thought. Acts chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. Now, growing up in the church like you, many of you, most of you, I have heard many sermons that go like this. Christ is not going to come back until we're living up to the straight testimony. Christ is not going to come back until we understand the true gospel, until we're living up to the correct understanding of righteousness by faith. You've heard that many times. All of that is important, and all of that has to do with my personal pre preparation and readiness for the coming of Christ, and it has to do with your being ready for the second coming of Christ. But God knows when the 7,000 are ready. He's always known that. That is a set date. That's a fixed time. I want to prove it to you. Acts chapter 1, verse 6. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Now that was, the, that was the burden on the hearts of the disciples. Before they met Jesus, during his ministry, even after his resurrection, they wanted to know when the kingdom would be set up. That's our question. That's our question. He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. It's not up to me or you to know the times or dates 
or the date of the second coming of Christ that the Father has set by his own authority. The date is set. And everything that we're concerned about, preaching the gospel around the world, being spiritually prepared, fulfillments of prophecy, all of these things, God with his infinite knowledge of the future has factored in and the date is set. And every day that passes, we're one day closer to the coming of Christ. Can you say amen to that? I want you to look with me now at a very important parable of Jesus, Matthew 25, verse 1. This is the parable of the uh, ten bridesmaids. I just referred to them a minute ago. And the question really is that I'm going to continue my message with now. Is it possible for us as Adventists to retard the coming of Jesus? Is it possible for us to retard the coming of Jesus? And in answer to that question, we're going to look at this very important parable, parable of Jesus, Matthew chapter 25 and verse 1. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps, but did not take any oil with them. The wise, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. Now, this next verse, this next verse, if you have your Bible open, or you have it on your cell phone, or your lap, or your iPad, this next verse is so important. It says in verse 5, the bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. Now here's the question. Was it the fault... <clears throat> Was it the fault of the ten bridesmaids that they fell asleep? No. What time do you think they normally scheduled weddings in Bible times? Probably sundown. And so the bridesmaids were ready with their little lamps and their oil because their mission, just like ours, our mission, their mission was to light the way of the coming of the bridegroom. It would be after dark, no street lamps, no lights. And so they would walk along with the wedding party and they had their little lamps shedding light so people would not stumble. So they would all get to the banquet hall together without injury. That was their job. Our job is to light the way for the coming of Christ. I said the wedding was probably around sundown. Maybe the sun set at 6 p.m. 7 p.m., they're still wide awake. 10 p.m., they're still wide awake. Midnight, they're not wide awake. Now, whose fault is it that there's a delay? Now, I'm going to change that. There is no actual delay. It seems like there is a delay to us, but because the date has always been set, because the times and the seasons are in the hands of God's incredible foreknowledge of history, the date has always been known. The reason the bridesmaids fall asleep is because the bridegroom tarries. How long has it been since Jesus left planet Earth? 2,000 years. You see? 2,000 years. No one in Bible times expected that that amount of time would pass. I did not expect that when I was a young pastor just starting out. 
I have to tell you, I've been to workers' meetings, pastors' meetings at Cedar Falls, and when my dad was a pastor in Central California Conference, and we went to camp meeting, we went to uh, uh, Wawona summer camp, workers would be talking about the return of Jesus, and older pastors, workers, would say, I thought Jesus was coming back when I began my ministry. They expected Christ to come long ere this. And so for some of us, prophecy fatigue sets in. Now your pastor's been kind enough to invite me to come back another time. And when I come back, I'm going to be discussing the fulfillments of Bible prophecy because Jesus said, watch and be ready. Watch, which is what we're going to do. But we're going to be watching with a sense of assurance that Jesus' coming is a fixed matter. It's not going to be endlessly delayed because some people in the church fall asleep. They were all asleep, and Christ came back anyway. Well, why did the bridegroom tarry? Um, maybe it was a test. Have you ever thought about that? Maybe it was a test for the church to see whether or not over the generations, over the centuries to come, we would remain faithful to Jesus and the gospel. Maybe there are other reasons of which we have no understanding at this time, but someday it will be explained to us. Maybe there are huge issues at play in Earth's history that we don't know about. But now we're going to part two of my sermon. Part two. If the date has been set, See, now this is my question. If the date has been set, how close is it? Are we getting there? How many want to know if we're getting there? Can I see your hand? Okay. Yes, indeed. My parents are gone. Many of my friends are gone. I can't tell you how many times I get called and told that another great brother, wonderful sister in the church have passed. It hurts me. I want the second coming to happen because I want to be back together again with my family and my spiritual brothers and sisters. I'm not going to give up my concern about when Christ is coming back. How close is it? Are we getting there? Well, I have dramatic news for you today that you probably have never heard before. Luke chapter 21, verse 24. Luke 21, verse 24. In this discourse, Jesus is talking about ancient Israel, about the Jews. Here's what he says. They will fall by the sword and will be taken as prisoners to all the nations. They will fall by the sword and be taken as prisoners to all the nations. Now, in AD 70, there was a terrible war between the Romans and the Jews. You've heard about it. Josephus has written about it. Jerusalem destroyed. Countless numbers of people lose their lives. But then later there was another war, far worse than AD 70, the War of 134. And you haven't heard much about that because very few of the Jews survived that war. They were slaughtered and they were taken to all the nations after 134. What happened? There was a madman, a messianic figure, who went by the title Bar Kokhba, son of the star. And he led the Jews in a ferocious rebellion. They almost beat the Romans. They almost won the war. 
The Romans had to send, they sent their entire navy that they had in the Mediterranean, and all the sailors on board the ships were impressed into their army because they lost so many men. Never in Roman history did they ever give three triumphs to a winning general at the end of a war. One triumph. But at the end of the Second Roman-Jewish War, they gave three triumphs out to commanders who had led the successful suppression of the Jews. They were scattered then. People hated the Jews. The Romans hated the Jews. If you kept Saturday, this is very important, if you kept Saturday, the seventh day of the week, as your Sabbath, your day of rest, as far as the Romans were concerned, you were a traitor because you were a Jew. And it became a matter of life and death for church people to give up Sabbath keeping and embrace the first day of the week. Now, do you understand that? It wasn't that the Pope suddenly announced, I'm changing the day of worship, or Constantine suddenly announced, I'm changing the day of worship. Your life was in jeopardy if you went to church on the Sabbath, the seventh day of the week. Now Jesus looks forward and he sees these terrible destructive wars coming. And he says, they will fall by the sword and will be taken as prisoners to all the nations. Jerusalem, now he's talking about the city itself. Jerusalem will be trampled on by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Jerusalem will be trampled on by the Gentiles. I've been in Jerusalem four times. I love that city. But you can see the destruction all over that city, all over that part of, of the ancient world. After the Jews were suppressed in 134, Romans took over for a long time. And then, uh, then the Greeks took over. And then finally the Muslims took over. And then the Turks took over. And then the British took over. Until 1967. Fix that date in your mind. I don't think much about 1798 or 1830 and all. The, I think about 1967. I was around in 1967. And in 1967, the Israeli Defense Force threw the Jordanian Foreign Legion out of Old Jerusalem. You can go to the Lion's Gate in Jerusalem and they and you can they haven't been repaired and you can still see all the bullet holes in the stone at the Lion's Gate. 1967. Jerusalem, the old city, was no longer trampled on by Gentiles. Now other people say 1967 is not the best date. It's a 1980 because in 1980 the um, Israeli parliament called the Knesset voted to formally annex the old city as, as, to par, as part of Israel, as part of their capital. It could be 1980, but I'm still inclined to leave, to lean towards 1967. I see Pastor Jeff here. We're going to have a good discussion about this after the service, all right? You know, when I was growing up in a minister's household, I had, two other, I had two uncles who were pastors. You got those guys together, they talked prophecy till 2 a.m. And there was little old me trying to be quiet over in the corner and hoping that my mother hadn't noticed I wasn't in bed. <laughs> Listening to my dad and my uncles debate the details of prophecy, you see. Look what this says. Listen to this again. Fall by the sword, be taken as prisoners. Jerusalem will be trampled on by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Now, we're not entirely sure what that means, the times of the Gentiles being fulfilled. Because if we go to Romans chapter uh, 11, it's, it, there we learn 
that the coming of Christ will not happen until the full number of Gentiles comes in. Until the full number of Gentiles comes in. Now, it could be that this is referring to the physical liberation of Jerusalem, but the Gentiles be fulfilled, that might refer to Jews around the world becoming Christians. Have you seen any sign of that? Yes, the messianic movement among the Jews. But 1967, now friends, this is a fulfillment of prophecy. And now, scratch your temple a little bit because you ought to be wondering right now why you haven't heard all about that before. Well, that's a long story why the church doesn't want to preach that. But uh, that's today. I've got some good stuff here for you. I've got some real good stuff. Now, here is a, here's a quotation from Our Firm Foundation, Volume 2, pages 230 to 231, written by Leroy Froome. Leroy Froome is the preeminent Adventist historian of his generation. These are thick volumes. Now, listen to what he says about what I'm talking about with you right now. However, there's one prophecy concerning Palestine that we should all be watching with special care, said Jesus. Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And then he goes on to say, uh, for 19th century, Jerusalem has been trodden down and so on. What could be the reason only that the times of the Gentiles are not yet fulfilled? In his day, prior to 67, he was still waiting for Jerusalem to be liberated. Our number one historian, all right? Now, here's a, here's a quotation from a Bible correspondence course you probably took when you were a kid or maybe when you were coming into the end of the church, 20th century Bible correspondence course. Listen to this. Old Jerusalem and the temple site has been occupied largely by the Gentile nations until 1967 when the Jews took possession of it in a lightning victory. This portion of Christ's prophecy was fulfilled in our day exclamation point. Have you really heard all about that? I don't think so. But they knew about it in the 20th century Bible course days. Here's a more modern study of the book of, 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 the book of Revelation. This is by J.R. Zercher. Any, any European, my wife is Swiss, any European name that ends in E-R is probably a Swiss person. Did you know that? You know, if you're a Swiss citizen, you're very lucky. They have, they have the second longest lifespan on earth, and the Swiss are the richest people on the planet. Did you know that? Now, this searcher working for the church probably did not get rich. Listen to what he said. Jerusalem here constitutes the last sign of the times by which the Lord shows us that the history of this world is coming to its climax. The last sign of the times, back in 67. The editor of uh, Signs of the Times, uh, Marvin Moore, believes that. I've talked with him about it. And he was pastor of our Mojave Church, which is part of our part of the West region here at one time. Now, why is it that hasn't been preached? Because our Sunday keeping friends are very committed to prophecy too, but they want to see all the prophecies connected with ancient Israel fulfilled. See? So I think, I'm guessing the brethren must think that uh, if they open the door a little bit here to saying the prophecy concerning Jerusalem will be fulfilled, that all the rest of the nonsense out there will rush right in. I don't think so. Jesus was very clear about that. That's astounding, 67 or 1980. Now what about all the other signs of the times? 
wars, rumors of wars, revolutions, earthquakes, famines, pestilences, persecutions. Any of you worried about North Korea today? I can't stop watching the news. I need a 12-step program <laughs> for news watchers. No time to go into that today, but with respect to all the signs of the times, Jesus gave us two clues, two clues in Matthew 24, Matthew 25. The first is the parable of the fig tree. And this is interesting because the parable of the fig tree is found in every one of the Gospels, all four Gospels. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see all these things, all these prophecies happening at the same time, even when you see all these things, you know that it is near right at the door. Now, there was another uh, instruction he gave here in Matthew 24, verse 26. So if anyone tells you there he is on the desert, do not go, or there he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as lightning comes from the east, is visible even in the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Very strange verse comes up next. Wherever there is a carcass, there the vultures will gather. Parable of the fig tree. You know, if you have a fig tree in your yard or wherever, and the fig trees, the twigs are coming out, and the figs are coming in, you know that when the figs are ripe, summer is here. Okay? What's this business about? The King James says eagles. No, not eagles. Vultures, buzzards. Buzzards. Wherever there is a carcass, there the vultures will gather. You've been on the country many times in the countryside. You see these ugly birds circling. What does that say? Something is dying. See? But they're circling. They've all come together and they're circling something. The signs of the times will all suddenly happen. And there you are. You're right at the door. The signs of the times will begin to circle, interconnected between them. And it'll be like all those vultures you see up there in the sky coming together because something big is coming our way. So that's some clues in advance of my next sermon as to how to take into account these signs. Look for connections, look for associations, look for them all happening. But Jesus said, watch. And now I'm, I have the assurance to know that Jesus is coming back the day to set. I feel great about that. I don't know when, but I have the prophecy of Luke 21. That's a lot of encouragement. What about the getting ready part? The being ready part? Well, Adventists have specialized in that subject. Really, you know, specialized in it. And all the discussions about, do you really understand righteousness by faith? See? Okay, now Matthew 25, verse 31. Uh, we're going to make it simple. Matthew 25, verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before him. He will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on the right and the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father. Take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the, found, since the creation of the world. Now, I'm all ears at this point, friends. I'm paying attention. This is the last judgment. And Jesus says, uh, uh, come, come, you, you folks. Take, take your inheritance. I want to be in that group. 
What qualifies me? What qualifies you to be in that group? Listen to what he says next. For I was hungry. You gave me something to eat. Thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. And you know how surprised the righteous are at that point. Well, when did we do all this? When did we do all this for you? <coughs> and Jesus replies, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did it for me. What is God looking for in the company of the blessed who are welcome to the inheritance prepared for them before the world was created? What is he looking for? Kindness towards others. Practical love and compassion towards others. You know, you, 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 you see that homeless person. Uh, you have some neighbors who are out of work. Your family members need help. Uh, and some people, for whatever bad reason, or they make a mistake, they're in prison. Do you, we go and see them? Do we visit them in the hospital? Uh, you know, uh, how well are we connected with the members of our church family in terms of knowing people's needs and how we can help each other? And that same thing goes true for our community. I'm very impressed. I've been so impressed. Been, you know, privileged to be an interim pastor for a while. I'm so impressed by how many churches have bold programs to help the people in the neighborhoods. Uh, you've got some ex-Hollywood people here. Great, I hope you're really nice to them because they're great folks. Um, Hollywood got training, help, put resources together to help one family on the street. Mother, three kids, one family on the street. Get her lodging, get her a job, get her training for that job, get medical care going, get the children in school, all of those things. And it took them a year, really, a special committee to help that one family. I say that's fantastic. <laughs> Praise the Lord for that program. We're looking around us at the world today, not just here in our country, but in other countries. People are so desperate. They need people who are real Christians so bad to step forward, help them out. And that's the only thing that's being asked in the judgment. Now, don't take this the wrong way, but the judge doesn't say anything about how well do you understand the details of prophecies. And, you know, were you in church as faithfully as you should have been, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? The real question is what do we do for other people? That's what's on God's mind. Because... The Lord says, when you're kind to other people, you're doing it for me. And we hear so much about the importance of having a wonderful relationship with Jesus. And that's so important. But you have a great relationship with Jesus when you help one of his children who needs help. If you're committed to helping in kindness people who need help, God will present you with many opportunities to help. I have one little story I want to tell you about what Christians do. Uh, we love going to Starbucks. <laughs> but we drink nice stuff there. You can, you can get veggie stuff there. Okay. And we made friends. We got one group. One of the nicest guys in the group is an atheist. He's gone to church with us. And another group, two ladies, uh, and they're like the best prayer warriors you ever met. And uh, um, one of them told us a story. She's a 
county social worker and, and uh, her specialty is helping children who need homes find adoptions, get adopted, you know? And that, that is so difficult because today so many of these little babies are drug addicted when they're born and so on. It's terrible. So anyway, she was sitting at her desk one day and this is the kind of thing that Christians do. Because let me tell you, if your heart if you, if service, if kindness towards others is on your heart, God is going to give you many opportunities. So she's sitting at her desk and a call comes in. Now the lady says, you know, uh, 21 years ago, uh, I rescued a baby and I just wanted to call county social services and find out how that baby is doing now after that baby, it was a, bo a little boy, after that child has reached 21. I want to find out. Well, our friend Lorna said, I'll, I'll, I'll find out if that's okay. So she talked to the, uh, she talked to the leaders and authorities in county social services. They said, no, we can't give out any information. Just because the baby is now a man of 21 years of age, we can't give out that information. So when the lady called back, she said, look, I'm so sorry. I can't give you any information. But our friend Lorna was curious about that baby because she knew the baby's name that the baby was given when it was found. It was called Baby Christian. So she went to the files and she got out the files from the past a long time ago. And sure enough, there was a... A, a new a column in the Los Angeles Times about this baby, and it was baby Christian. So she said, well, I'm going to talk to the social worker who was in charge of that at that time, see? She called that social worker, another lady, and the social worker said, well, this is what happened. The woman who called you liked to go on runs in the mountains. She had trails and fire break roads and, and all along the roads and she loved to go running with her two dogs. And uh, she said that one day as she was running along uh, there was another dog, a third dog. So she's, she, and she was friendly to it and he began to follow her. And so she went home, the dog followed her all the way home. Now she had three dogs, they were all off leash, and they all followed her up, running around, and so she had a, a new dog. She went back the very next day, running the same route, and when she got out to the highway, there was a car parked there. And she, she, was running past the car and the window was down and somebody in the car said, hello, hello, hello. So she went back. This person said, uh, that, that little black dog you've got there. Yes, that's my dog. I lost it. So uh, the lady who's out running, she said, well, here, let me give it back. The other lady said, no, no, no. That's my dog, but uh, I don't want it back. You keep it. You keep it. So she thanked her, and she went off on a run, completed her run the next day, doing the same course again, the same, taking the same path. And as she comes up to the highway, there's the same car. And the windows roll down, and as she runs past, starts past, the lady in the car says, hello, hello, hello. So, yeah, well, she comes over, and the lady said, you know, I changed my mind. I want my dog back. And the lady who was running said, it's my dog now. <laughs> you gave it to me. Now the lady in the car got pretty mad. She really got mad, you know. So the next day comes and the lady who got the free dog, she's thinking, now if I take that same route, <laughs> that car could be there and maybe this time the lady will do more than kind of chew me out. She'll really be mad. I'm going to take a different route. So, with her three dogs, she takes a different path. Down 
the hills, up the hills, along the side of the hills, and all of a sudden, her three dogs disappear. They go, they're like little rockets. They're like little bolts of lightning. Boom, they're gone. What in the world? They always stayed with her. So she, I better follow my dogs. So she follows them and go and chases them and follows them. And finally she sees them at a little distance there. And as she's walking up to the three dogs, they're looking at something on the ground. And as she gets closer, she can see that there's a, there's a little foot is being lifted up in the air. Lifted up in the air. Down and up again. And she walks over, and it is a baby in a shallow grave. Still covered with dirt but it was still alive enough to get its little leg up, its little leg up. And so she picked that baby up. She took it to the authorities, got it to the authorities just in time, and they named it Baby Christian. Now this is the point, friends. That is what Christians do. If you have a heart to help, to show God's love to others, God has already prepared, according to Ephesians chapter 2, God has already prepared good works for you to do. You don't have to seek them out. Just keep your eyes open, and if your dogs chase off across the meadows, follow them, okay? That's what Christians do. I know you have stories like that. I know you do. God bless you, folks. As we try to help people in a world in which it's so desperately important that we go out of our way to help people meet Jesus.